<laughs> All right. So, Chapter 7. Okay, we're going to be dealing with the Real Estate License Act. Now, this is important. This is extremely important. Uh, this is the only time, the only time we actually talk about the real estate license exam in the state of Texas. Okay? So out of all of the times and months we've been teaching, this is the only time we're actually going to talk about Texas. And if you notice, Mr. Uh, Aiden, how many slides were there? Uh, you remember? No. 140 something slides. So they put the entire Texas exam in one chapter and shoved it all together. Okay? So we're not going to be able to cover all of this tonight. It's impossible. Okay? We're going to get as far as we can, but I want every one of you to be alert because this is what your Texas exam is going to be on. Does that make sense? So the entire Texas exam, the one by itself, is out of this chapter. Okay, so extremely important that you do follow along because we won't talk about Texas anymore. All right, so the learning objectives is we are going to identify the purpose of licensing laws, the activities that are required for a license, the situations that may not require a license, the types of license categories. We'll describe the membership and scope of authority of TREC and the Broker Lawyer Committee. We'll distinguish the general and education requirements for broker and sales agent. We'll also discuss the procedures for receiving or renewing an active or inactive license. We'll also explain the purpose and operation of the Real Estate Recovery Trust Fund. We'll identify the reasons for which a license may be suspended or revoked. We'll discuss the manner in which the Real Estate Commission may investigate a licensee. Whatever disciplinary actions are available to track. Those are going to be our key. Okay. So the Real Estate License Act. What is it actually called? What's the acronym we use for the Real Estate License Act? TRALA. Okay. So when I talk through here, I'm not going to say the Real Estate License Act, I'm going to say trailer, Because on the licensing exam, they are going to say trailer. Okay? So you need to make certain that you know the difference. Now, who enforces trailer, Mr. Eugene? Four letter word. Trick. Okay? Trek, the Texas Real Estate Commission enforces TRALA. Okay, so TRALA was passed in 1949. You will need to know that date. Okay, it is an Occupations Code, Chapter 1101, Title 7. It is revised in most legislative sessions. Every session, there is some revision to Trek or to TRALA. It regulates the industry. It tells you who it protects, which is the public, prescribe the standards to maintain those standards, and to protect against unfair competition. Okay. The definitions that you will be going through, and we're not going to go through them right now, but these are going to be the ones that you're going to be aware of, are terms like broker, business entity, certificate holder, commission, license holder, real estate, residential rental locator, sales agent, and sub-agent, okay? So what exactly is a broker? Hey, what's a broker, sir? Um, I mean, like a, I mean, you, but somebody who's over, somebody who's had their license for at least five years and can sign on to real estate transactions. I don't know what that means. You're, you're on it. Basically, it's someone that does what? It's an individual that their duty, their job, is to end up, they are the main person, they are the agent on behalf of a client, a principal. So, 
as it says up here, it's a person who in exchange for a commission or other valuable consideration or with the expectation of receiving a commission or other valuable consideration performs for another person one of the following acts. Okay, and here are those acts. If we're going to sell, exchange, purchase, rent, or lease real property, if we're going to put offers to negotiate or attempt to negotiate, list, offer, attempt, or agree to list, auction, or deals in options on real estate, as well as aiding in locating, procuring prospects, procuring properties, accepting rent for a single family residence, provides a written analysis, opinion, or conclusion related to an estimated price, or advises on a short sale, then that individual is going to be classified as a real estate broker, not an agent. So don't let, see here's the thing, Broker, when we started talking about agency and contract and all that, we were talking about agent. So that means you, right, uh, Aiden? You're the agent, so you can you can represent individuals without a broker, right? It's incorrect. Incorrect. Why is it incorrect? Uh, because I have to have, I'm just working under you as a, a broker. You're working on behalf of me. On behalf, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You work on behalf of me. So in that situation is, while I can end up doing these and these and the other things that we're going to talk about, I can do all of these things. Is it possible, Travis, that I can do all of these by myself? No, no especially if I have a lot of clients. No. Okay, if I have a hundred clients, it's kind of to come back to the situation. If you've ever worked, you know, I know that you have worked in a restaurant. Imagine you having to do everything in your job. There's a hundred customers that just walk in and you're by yourself. You got to do it all by yourself. Imagine how, how much that would take. You, you'd probably just walk out and quit, wouldn't you? Yeah. Okay. If you ever worked in real, any type of restaurant industry and you had to do everything from taking the orders to cooking the orders to doing everything else, you probably would just walk out. Okay. You'd say, I give up. I'm out of here. Okay. So the same thing is in this situation is as a broker, is the one that's responsible for everything. However, I have to have help. And to have help, who, who helps me? The agents, the real estate agents, that's right, okay? So, as it says up here, a broker also includes a person who is employed by or for an owner to sell any portion of real estate or charges an advance fee or contracts to collect a fee to promote the sale of real estate by listing the real estate in a publication used for listing of real estate or referring information about the real estate to brokers okay, and that's your MLS. Now, does that, before I jump on, does that make sense to you all about what a broker is? Okay, so if you notice as a broker, there's a lot, okay, there's a lot. The broker has to do it all. But again, is it possible for the broker to do it all? No, it's very difficult, okay. You have to be very careful. But if you as a real estate agent ever think, well, I'm going to try to do some of these things that's listed up here, and I'm just not going to get a real estate broker to sponsor me, well, you're in trouble because you're in violation. Okay, you have to have a broker. Now, what exactly is a business entity? Stephanie, what's a business entity? Who, who's your sponsoring broker? Um, no, sir. I retract. No, sir. Who's your sponsoring broker no. back there? Oh, Noble's Realty Group. I don't sponsor you. Noble's Realty Group does. And Noble's Realty Group is who? A business entity. A business entity. Now, I am the officer, the designated broker of said entity, but ultimately you are sponsored by who? Noble's Realty Group. You work for Keller Williams. That's a business entity. Okay, you are sponsored by Keller Williams. Okay. So in these situations is a business entity can either be domestic or foreign. Now, Travis, I'm going to test you, or test you. What exactly does foreign entity mean? 
Does it? Except if it's based outside of the US. See, that's where I was, I was hoping you'd do that for me. You saved me on it. That's wrong. I was in Texas. It's going to be outside of Texas. Yes. Yep. See, a lot of people, and, and Travis, that's the normal yeah. thing everybody does, is they assume foreign means outside of the United States. Okay? In reality, it just means anything that's outside of Texas. So if Mr. Eugene, you go open a business in Oklahoma, you're a foreign entity. You're not part of the state of Texas. While in Texas, we call it a domestic entity it's in the state. And it's formed under or for the internal affairs of which are governed by the Texas Business Organization's code or the laws of another state. Okay. Now, what is a certificate holder? Well, it's a person that's registered under subchapter K, which is a easement or right of way certificate registration. We'll come back to this one. Commission. Well, commission means this. It's not talking about what you make after you make a sale. They're talking about the commission when you read the commission in the statute. Okay. We're talking about the Texas Real Estate Commission, which is TREC. Now you'll notice something up here at the very top. Just if you've been watching as we've been going through these, look at these numbers in the top left-hand corner. Okay, these are statutes. Okay, what that means is if you pull the Real Estate License Act and you go to subsection 1101.002, subsection three, guess what happens? You're going to pull up the word commission, and you're going to see the definition says the Texas Real Estate Commission. So that means anything throughout the entire statute. That says the word commission applies to what, Aiden? Yeah. The Texas correct. Real Estate Commission. That's correct. Okay. That's how you read this stuff when you're going through laws. Okay. Now, what about license holder? Who's a license holder? Mr. Eugene, who would be a license holder? Well, an agent. Uh, I mean, for real estate. So you, so you say that Travis and I am a license holder? Well, yeah, but you got you got a broker's license. You just got an agent's license. But we're but I'm I, I'm not a license holder, right? I'm, he's a license holder, not me, right? Yeah, you're a broker. You got to have a license. That's right. See, people get that confused. A license holder is either a broker or a sales agent. You see what I'm saying? There? So this would be one that if they're talking about license holder in the law. It could be either or. It could be Travis or myself. Okay, so it's either or of us. Now, what? Now you're probably asking me, why in the world are we learning all of this stuff? Why are we needing to learn definitions? Well, here's the thing, Mr. Stephan and Abe and Travis. Question for y'all: um, When you take the test, do they uh, spell out things really sweet for you on the test? No. What do they do? Why do they want to trick you? Why do they want to trick you, Aiden? Make sure you know who you're talking about. Ah. So that's the thing, the whole thing here is they use multiple words in hopes that you're going to do what? They're going to trick you up. Okay. So that's what they're hoping for. So don't let these words, these definitions, throw you. Does that make sense? Okay. So any interest in real property including a leasehold located in or outside the state is going to be classified as real estate. Okay. A residential rental locator. Their duty, their only duty is to offer a, to locate a unit in an apartment complex for lease to a prospective tenant. Do these people, Aiden, do these individuals, do they represent people in purchasing, buying and purchasing homes? No. What do they do? What's their sole intent? Find prospective tenants for leasing. And it's normally focused at what level? Apartments. At apartments. Okay. So these people are not the same as a leasing agent. These people focus solely on apartments only. Okay. Now, what about a sales agent? Now, this one I know is rocket science. So, so Aiden, I'm going to come back to you again. I, what's a sales agent? Somebody who you need to tag Travis in. Because I know it's rocket science. Yeah. 
think I should be able to get it. Okay. Somebody who's licensed and able to that sponsors on behalf people, right? of a broker that sponsors people. No, no, no. I'm wrong. No. Okay, tell, tell me again. Let's see. So a sales agent is someone who has the license to under on behalf of a broker sell and buy real estate. And this that person can have relationships, a, a principal agency relationship without a broker, right? No. No. Most of a broker. Travis, what is this broker thing he's talking about? Oh, man, I'm, crazy. Man, I'm so, so confused here. Right <laughs> so that's right. A sales agent is associated with a licensed broker, and the broker is the one that activates your license. Okay. So they perform acts or transactions defined in the act of the name of the broker. Stephan, does this at all say anywhere up here under broker? Does this mean client? Skip. We're going to continue and hope you got it recorded. It. Uh -huh. Hold on just a minute, everybody. No, just let it be. Yes. It still says it's recording. Okay. We're having some technical issues today. Of course. It's a Monday, right? A Monday. Everything that can go wrong goes wrong on a Monday. All right. So, in this coming back here, Stephen, what I was going to ask you is, is it says in the name of the broker? Can this ever be the client? Can you and say Lila? Could you, as an agent, represent Lila without me? No, without you? Yeah. No. Why not? Because I have to go through you. So you. So who's the relationship? Lila's a buyer. Who's the relationship with? Relationship with me? Or with, her? with me. With you is she you. gonna have a relationship with me? No, she's not. Yes, she will. Because I'm her agent. Well, she's you. the principal. You are my sub agent, which then you indirectly have a relationship with her. Right. Make sense? Okay. I'm just making certain we stay on this. So a sub agent. It represents a party or a principal through cooperation with and the consent of a broker representing the principal and is not sponsored by or associated with the principal's broker. Okay, got to be very careful here. All right, so let's get into this point. This is where everybody starts wanting to know about qualifying real estate courses. Okay, qualifying real estate courses. There are certain courses that you must take to get your real estate license. And those courses are not every one of these that are up here. Every semester, students always ask me, they say, I gotta take all of these courses? No, no. The ones you must take, you must take agency law, contract law. You're currently in this third one, principles of real estate, real estate finance, and guess what else? Contract forms and addenda. Okay. The other ones are elected. Property management, real estate appraisal, real estate brokerage, and real estate investment. Okay. Every one of those are optional courses. If you want to become a real estate broker, you got to take this course. You gotta take that course, okay? You gotta take the broker. If you're going to take appraisals, you wanna get into appraising? You gotta take that one, plus many more, okay? It's not just one. There's also real estate law, real estate marketing, and real estate math, okay? Now, TREC may designate what's called equivalent courses but by the rule, they're prescribed additional qualifying courses and qualifying course content, All right? Now, let's jump back over here. Acting as a broker or a sales agent. 
A person is going to act as a broker or sales agent if that person with the expectation and consideration performs or offers to perform for another person any act that is described in subsection 1101.002 subsection 1, okay, which is basically what we talked about earlier. What about the applicability of this chapter? Well, here, this is where they're going to get you on the test, too. Okay? Very key. You need to know this. These individuals that we're talking about now are exempt from getting their real estate license. But there's rules to it. The very first one is an attorney licensed in Texas. If, for example, that Mr. Keith is an attorney and he is a licensed attorney, and Mr. Keith goes over and he happens to deal with probate and he lists properties for sale and uh, he does them maybe two times a year, okay? He most likely does not need a real estate license, okay? He does it on the side. Can though, is Keith, Mr. Travis, do you think Mr. Keith is entitled to a commission? So if he ends up there's a, a listing or whatever. Can Keith get a commission if there's an agent involved? No. They have to charge by retainer or hourly fee, not by a commission. Okay? So they can't share in regards to the commissions that you and I would get. Okay? So, if an attorney wants to practice in real estate and actually sell houses, guess what that means? They got to get a what? Real estate license. But on the general, if it's on the side, they don't need a license, but they also don't have access to the MLS. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, what exactly is an attorney in fact? A, I saw your eyes. Um, what's an attorney in fact? My eyes, you probably saw that and no clue. Yeah. An attorney at law is what? Someone who uh, practices law. Someone that practices law. An attorney, in fact, practices fact. Practices yeah. fact. Yeah. Yeah. We got it, guys. <laughs> I practice the code. So, so, what is it, Stefan? An attorney, in fact. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, a lifeline. A lifeline? Yeah. Can I call someone? So I'll help y'all all out here. Mr. Eugene, your mother, when she was alive, had a power of attorney. In that power of attorney, you were second in line to be what to her if she was <clears> in <throat> the hospital? Not exactly. Yes, her. Yes, her mouthpiece. You're her mouthpiece. When you are, when there is a power of attorney, you are the attorney in fact. So in that situation, had you gone in and your mother said, I, I'm going under the knife, I need somebody to make decisions on my behalf, at that point, you're acting as the attorney in fact. Well, so, you still have to be a licensed attorney. No, sir. You don't? No, sir. I can go draft up a power of attorney right this minute. And I can designate my father to be my attorney in fact if I go in the hospital. He can, on my behalf, act as myself and make decisions on my behalf while I am unconscious. It doesn't be related to you. No, sir. I can put you as an attorney in fact. Okay. I can make any one of you an attorney in fact. It comes down to do I trust you to do the right thing. Does mm -hmm. so that make sense? Okay. So it comes down to that situation is. Do I, are you making the right decisions on my behalf? Okay. But you do not have to be a lawyer. Now, why this works this way is because of this purpose. The so situation, for example, like you said earlier, Mr. Eugene, about the executor. Okay. Sometimes a person needs to sell a property. And they want to sell that property on behalf of an estate. They can end up, they can put a sign up and do all of the transaction and everything with an attorney in fact, 
and be able to sell that property. Okay, so sometimes it may be necessary. But say that Mr. Garrett, he says, man, I just can't pass the real estate license exam. This thing's too hard. I know Mr. Noble said in here that I can sell property as an attorney in fact. So what I'll do is I'll just go to every client and have them draft up or sign an attorney in fact and I'll sell the property. That's what I'll do. Okay. Well, here's the thing. I believe the law right now says you can do no more than two transactions as an attorney in fact a year. So while Mr. Garrett could sell two properties, that's it for the entire year. Okay. Nothing else. So that's only going to sell a billion dollar house. You going to sell a billion dollar house? Yeah, I'll do two of them each year. There you go. See, he's, he's got this down already. He's got this down. So in that situation, as you see, I mean, you could legally do it, but again, you're limited to two. So you like Garrett said, you better make sure they're your big ones because otherwise you're not going to make it. Now, what is a political or public official? Now that one I know is difficult. Mr. Eugene, what's a public official? Mm -hmm. well, that's like uh, a mayor. Or a what about the president? President, yeah. What about a judge, a county judge? Sure. Anyone that serves in a public, public office. office is a public official, is exempt. Okay. Persons conducting an auction under the authority of a license issued by this state. Okay, that's another one. Person under the court authority or court order or authority of a wheel. This goes back to that one. If you don't have an attorney, in fact, you use a wheel. A builder's employee. This is what gets all my agents every day. Well, how is this person able to sell a property when they don't even have a real estate license? How are they able to sell this, this home for the builder? when they don't even have a real estate license. Well, here's the thing. They're a what? They're an employee. And they're acting on the, the behalf of who? The builder. So in that situation, as long as they are only selling that builder's home, they do not need a real estate license. They don't get a commission. Either. Yes, they do. But it is based upon a contractual agreement between their boss, the employer, and the employee. That makes sense, okay? But they cannot go show other properties, okay? What about an on-site apartment manager? Do they need to be, say you live in an apartment complex, does that person that's the manager have to be a real estate agent? No, they're exempt, okay? A owner leasing his or her own real estate if Mr. Eugene, you're selling your own property, mm -hmm. you don't need to be a real estate agent. Right. You can sell it on your own. Okay. Any transactions involving mineral or mining interests, cemetery lots, lease or management of a hotel or motel, or foreclosure sale is exempt. Okay. Now, before I jump into this one, okay. What we want to talk about is while you can be exempt, and this is where I get students every semester that says, well, I need to just go ahead and, you know, I, there's so many exceptions in here. I can just represent myself. I don't need this classes, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to quit and I'm just going to go on and, and get attorney of facts and do like Garrett said and sell two properties every year. Okay. Here's the problem. If you're exempt from a real estate license, do you get access to the MLS? you get access to any of the tools that we get access to? Nope. No. So yes, while there are exceptions to the rule, the chances of you actually selling the property is what? Slim to none. Slim to none. Okay. You may get lucky, you may get it so, but it's not gonna be consistent. Or if it does get so, it may be months if not years down the road, okay? So, again, while those are exceptions, they're not 
good for you to be doing and trying to make it as practice, if that makes sense. Okay. Now, under the application of Sunset Act, Trek subjects to the Texas Sunset Act, which requires review of the state agency every 12 years, every 12 years, to determine if they should be abolished. Why do they call it the Sunset Act? The sunset right here. It means that this code is up for possibly being wiped away. They don't see any reason to consider it or continue it. Okay. So in this particular situation, our review was up in 2019. So when's it due again, Mr. Eugene? That's 2020. No, no, no. Every 12 years. Oh, 12 years. Okay. 31. Well, 1 plus 1 is 2, and 9 plus 2 is 11. So 2031 gives you what? 2031 is when your next review is going to be. By then, I'll be an old man. Okay? Aiden probably be about 100 and something, but I'll still only be about 21. So, yeah. is that right, Aiden? Yeah, yeah, probably. Stephen, you'll be about 200, right? By then? Somewhere around there. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> So, just for everybody to know, it'll only be about 60, right? Oh, no, 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 Miss Leela. I stopped at 21 and I stay at 21. I just add my numbers off to everybody else. Okay, never mind. Is, is, <laughs> does, that, does that work for you, Miss Leela? You do the same thing, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> my grandfather said he was excited. He had turned 21 for the 43rd time. 21 for the 43rd time. There you go. There you go. I like that. So, but no, I probably would be. But no. we don't look that way no more, so. <laughs> hey, we, we just need to get some, what is that, uh, Botox. Get some Botox, Miss Leela. We'll be good. So our face will never move. That's right. Again. Okay. <laughs> Your age, or look like a 21 year old lizard. <laughs> 21 year old lizard. <laughs> oh, goodness. But no. So, yes, it, it looks like I said, at 2031, I'll probably be around my 50s or 60s, which is crazy. But, uh, but yeah, it does it every 12 years. Every 12 years. So, what about the nine members uh, that are appointed by the governor? Okay, well, it's the Texas Real Estate Commission. There are going to be nine members that are appointed by the governor. Very key here. They will ask this question. They ask how many members there are. There are nine. Who appoints them? The governor. And who approves them? The Senate. Not the House. The Senate. Now, of those nine members, six must be brokers. And three are general public representatives. Okay? You have to know every one of those numbers. Now, the Texas Real Estate Commission, the terms are basically staggered every six years. Okay, so you serve a six-year term. And the pay that you get for serving is $75 per day plus reimbursement of your actual expenses. Doesn't that just sound nice? $75 a day plus your actual expenses. So when people go to go in for this job or work for this, this part, when they travel or whatever, do you think they're going to travel cheap? No, they're going to travel high because what are they reimbursed? Actual expenses. Okay, it's not a cap. The executive director and others, so Drake does have an executive director, and they can also designate a deputy executive director. They may employ others to administer and enforce subsection 1101 and 1102 as well. The general powers and duties that are given through the administration of TRELA that are vested in TREC is that TREC shall administer subsection 1101 and 1102 regulate the advertising by residential rental locators, register certificate holders, and also adopt a seal. 
Okay. Trek further can adopt and enforce different rules that are necessary to administer subsection 1101 and 1102. And they can also establish the standards of conduct and ethics to fulfill the purposes of 1101 and 1102, further ensuring the compliance with 1101 and 1102 as well. Okay. And if you're wondering what is this 1101 and 1102, just look up at the top left hand corner here. That's what we're talking about. Okay. So everything we're talking about is just saying that Trek has the right to do this. Trek also can establish the fees in regards to what it costs to file your original application, your annual license renewal, the license examination fee, the charge for sponsoring a broker, and the more moral character determination. When I first started in real estate, I had to pay a fee to change brokers. I think it was 20 bucks or 30 bucks, somewhere in there. So every time you change your broker, you had to pay fees. Okay, I think ever since they've changed that, there's no fee anymore. I don't, I'm not 100% certain on that, but I think they got rid of the fee. They also can charge fees for the registration of an easement or right of way agent, the branch license, the change of place of business, change of name, and the return to active status. You notice they love to do what? Fee you to death. Okay. They also, Mr. Eugene, just for you, they created these fees too. So if you need to replace a lost or destroyed license, you need an approval of an education program, annual operation of your education program, the instructor for qualifying real estate courses, your transcript evaluation, the preparing of your license or registration history, or your criminal history, we, we are more than happy to feed you to death. Thank you. You are very well. Would you like some more fees? That's okay. I'll probably get more either. Well, we do have additional fees up here for you. Oh, great. Just, just for you. Super. Just for me. Just for you. The, the Real Estate Center here at Texas A&M University, and, and you are reading that correctly. Uh, what's it say, Aiden, here? Texas A&M University. Where is Texas A&M University? College Station. College Station. So the Texas Real Estate Research Center, which is located here in Bryant College Station, <laughs> is that the fees that are added to the annual license renewal for the support of the Real Estate Center, which like I said, is located here at Texas A&M. Uh, the broker license, there is a $70 charge. Sales agent license, 20. And the registration certificate of registration is also 20. These fees go to the Texas Real Estate Research Center and their sole purpose is to assist real estate agents in basically creating content so you can market yourself to other individuals. Does that make sense? Okay, you'll know those infographics that we use in our meetings. You can thank this place right here. That's your $20 you're putting to play to help you there, okay? So some business things there that can help you. I oftentimes try to bring in one of the individuals from this center. It's very difficult to get him in. For him to come in and talk to agents, depending on if they're being nice or not, can range between $2,000 to $10,000 to have somebody come talk to you, okay? But uh, that's why it's only once a year I have y'all talk to me. So, but again, uh, they come in and they kind of give you a lot of background and they can tell you exactly what they are expecting was going to happen in any, any individual area in the entire state of Texas. So if you're thinking what's going to happen in Amarillo, they can pull the data and tell you every little thing about Amarillo. They, they can take down to the street where the best streets to be. Okay. So they know a lot of information um, and very, very helpful, very helpful information. Uh, the rules relating to the contract forms, again, TREC may adopt rules requiring the license holders to use contract forms. Again, these are prepared by the Broker Lawyer Committee. Remember we talked about this before. The Broker Lawyer Committee prepares the forms. They are then approved and promulgated by who, Aiden? TREC. Okay. However, TREC may not prohibit the use of forms that are prepared by property owner or prepared by an attorney and required by the owner. 
So Mr. Eugene, got a question. Yep. So Miss Leela comes into your office mm -hmm. and Miss Leela says, uh, Mr. Eugene, I would like you to represent me. And you go over in the situation and you say, for example, uh, you, or Miss Leela says, I want you to list my property. Okay, so you list it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Garrett comes in, submits a contract to look one to four family to you. You give it to Miss Leela and she says, nope, 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 nope. Not using that form. I know what I'm doing. And she pulls out a piece of paper, she puts it down, and she says, I sell my house to Garrett for $500,000. And she signs her name, she gives it to you. And she says, I want to use this contract. And you say, but Miss Leela, well, 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 there's nine pages of that document right here. Why are you, you just wrote that on a sheet of paper. This, this protects you. And Miss Leela says, no, I want you to use this one sheet of paper I wrote on. Mr. Eugene, do you have to use it? Well, she says so. Yes, you do. She, she says so. She's your boss. That's right. You have to end up, you what have to use says. what she says. Now, does that mean that Mr. Garrett has to agree to that? No. Yes. Oh, he does? He does, because he may say, I'm not signing that sheet of paper. Oh, no. Do you see where I'm coming in from this? Oh. Okay. So if your property owner prepares their own form and mandates it, guess what? You got to use it. No ifs, ands, buts. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now, Trent may not restrict the advertising or competitive bidding except to prohibit false, misleading, or deceptive practices. So they cannot restrict your advertising or any type of competitive bidding unless you are making false, misleading, or deceptive practices. Does that make sense? Now, TRET may not include a rule that restricts the use of any advertising medium, which means TRET cannot come out tomorrow and say, okay, all real estate agents, y'all can't use social media anymore. They can't do that, okay? Because that would be restricting the use of an advertising medium, okay? They cannot restrict the person's personal appearance or use of the person's voice in an advertisement. They can't say, Oh God, you're too ugly. We don't want you. We don't. We're banning you from being able to be on advertising. Okay, can't you can't do that. I got a mask on though. Oh, you got well. Yeah. Keep the mask on. We'll let you. We'll let you at that point. Okay, okay. Travis. We yeah. You, the mask. Okay. You might want to pull it up just a little bit more, just to cover up here. Uh, and I I <laughs> <laughs> but no, you can't in that situation. Hey, no, I'm I mess with you all the time. I got to give you a hard time, bro. But no, they can't. They can't say something to me like, just your voice sounds too nasally, so you can't be in any type of advertisement. You can't do that either, okay? You have to, in the situation, they have to allow everybody the same opportunities, okay? It relates to the size or duration of an advertisement. They can't tell you, Mr. Eugene, you talk too much, so we, we're going to cut you down. You only get 10 seconds, okay? They, they can't do that, okay? <laughs> And they can't restrict the person's advertisement under a trade name. They can't do that either. Okay. Now, Trent may request and, if necessary, compel a subpoena if there's an issue. Say that I'm trying to get something from Stefan and Stefan won't give it to me. Well, Trent, if I'm Trent, can request and actually get a subpoena to either get basically attendance of witnesses records, documents, or other relevant information that I need, okay? Trent may, through, and this is very key here, the Attorney General, not Trent, but the Attorney General, can file suit to enforce the subpoena in a district court in the county in which the hearing is held. So Trent themselves are not attorneys, and since they're not attorneys, they have to rely on the attorney general to file suit on their behalf to enforce the subpoena. Okay. Now, what about complaints? Well, the public is entitled to know where to file their complaints. And that's why we have the consumer information form. Okay. And if you look up Texas or TREC consumer protection form, it'll pop up. But there's a form that explains to any general member of the public where they can file complaints at. Okay. The complainant and license owner are entitled to 
the explanation of available remedies and other state and local agencies with whom the complainant may be filed, right? You do not want a complaint filed against you. The worst thing you can do is to have a complaint filed against you, okay? Because TREC does not play along with that. Okay? They, don't, they don't play around with that. Now, TREC, of course, is going to maintain complaint files. They're going to ask for the information that is relating to the parties, the subject matter of the complaint, the subject of review or investigation, or disposition of the complaint. There are, of course, are periodic updates until it has been resolved. Okay. Can you submit an anonymous complaint? Most of the time, no. Why? Because you are entitled to know who is accusing you of the complaint. If I wanted to file complaints anonymously, well, what's going to happen? Well, I can sit down. If I don't like Stefan and I'm another agent, what can I do? I just sit down and write know. complaints all day long about Stefan Grossman. Okay. Worst agent, sucks, terrible, doesn't return phone calls, blah, 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 right? Then what happens? All of a sudden, he gets bombarded with what? All these complaints, and he don't know who to go after or who to talk to, okay? So, again, they have to end up, the parties have to provide their information. Trent may initiate investigation, okay? Once they end up, they get a complaint. They can initiate investigation. Trent shall investigate signed written complaints, okay? If evidence pres uh, presents reasonable cause for the investigation, that also will prompt them. There is a four-year statute of limitation, though, meaning that after four years, TREP can't do anything about it, okay? Written notice to the license holder is required. There is limited covert and undercover investigations. Yes, they will sometimes send somebody to come in and look. If there's a complaint against you, Aiden, say Leela complained about you, they may send Keith in to act like a client to see if you're going to end up treating him the same way you treated Leela. Okay? So, and you'll know nothing about it because it's undercover. But there are no anonymous complaints. None. Trek shall assign force priorities and investigate complaints that are based upon the degree of potential harm to a consumer. If there's potential or immediate harm to a consumer, if there is several of allegations, that's that one where I sit down and I get everybody to write up a complaint about Stephen. So all of us in here, we write a complaint up about Stephen. Well, guess what? Because there's a lot of them, they're going to come in and they're going to investigate. Okay. The number of license holders that are involved is a lot of them they're going to check they're also going to look at any previous complaint histories and the number of potential violations yes that means you as a real estate agent can have multiple let me say that again multiple violations against you that makes sense the investigation file of course is going to be confidential and not subject to the disclosure under the Open Records Act. Meaning that, Mr. Eugene, if I want to find out why you are currently being investigated and I've tried to file an Open Records Act, guess what? It's declined, it's confidential, okay? What may be disclosed is to the respondent of the complaint. So in that situation, Mr. Eugene, you can find out, if you're the respondent, to a person that is the subject of an audit or to an expert witness or an investigator, okay? It may also be disclosed to an entity in another jurisdiction. If law enforcement asked for it, if the state office of administrative hearings asked for it, they can also the commission themselves or a panel within the commission can get it. Open record is after the dismissal or final resolution. So after Mr. Eugene, we've gone through and we've done our due diligence and it's all done, then we can now get a copy of it, but it's only after the fact, okay? Now you can, with public participation, TREC does allow certain meetings to be open to the public and they are accessible to non-English speaking or disabled individuals. 
Okay, so you can go in and sit in a meeting if you want to. And sometimes they actually put it on Facebook. You can literally sit there and watch it on Facebook. The Broker Lawyer Committee has a membership of 13 people. You need to know that number. There are six brokers appointed by TREF. People get this wrong. They put governor. Who appoints the governor? Who's the ones the governor appoints for? TREF. The broker lawyer committee comes from TREF inside of TREF. So if six brokers are appointed by TREF, six members of the state bar of Texas are appointed by the president of the state bar, and one public member is appointed by the governor. You're going to have to get those and stay on top of those because I guarantee you they will test you on those. Their terms are going to be staggered terms of six years, four expire every two years, and six year terms for the public member. Okay. What exactly does the broker lawyer committee do? Well, the purpose, real simple, is to draft forms that are to be promulgated by TREC or approved by TREC. So this committee, all they do is draft forms. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it, Seth? No, it sounds like no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't want to draft forms all day? I have done enough of that. We'll let Aiden do it. Aiden loves drafting forms. And, and Miss Leela, you do a great job of making you a paperwork. You, you'd love this job. I'll, I'll make sure to appoint you to this one. So, as I know, y'all would love to. How much they pay? Oh, it's nothing. It's free, Miss Leela. Then lose my number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Is it's a committee. It's all volunteer. Because <laughs> remember, the only people who get paid is Trek, and they get paid their whole seventy-five dollars a day. Woo! So I mean, you you can make tons of money, Mr. Eugene, over there, seventy-five dollars a day. <laughs> You'll pass. So again, as you can see, they end up, their duty is just to draft papers. That's it. Now, here's the question that every exam is going to focus on right here. Every exam is going to harp on this. This is when a license is required. With or without a broker or without a broker or sales agent's license, a person may not act as or represent that he or she is a broker or sales agent that's pretty simple okay act as a residential rental locator that's simple okay without a license a business entity cannot act as a broker no license required for sole proprietor though okay so these are pretty simple on this slide real real simple however the applicant may not act as a license holder until when, Aiden? The license is received. When they actually get it, okay? So just because you might have gone out and filed your application and did everything they said, and it takes them, say, six months to get it to you, well, you can't practice for that six months, okay? The sales agent may not act as a sales agent unless they are associated with a licensed broker. So that means that even say, say Aiden, that your license did, you've got an inactive license, you still can't act as an agent until when? Until uh, I reactivate. Nope, right here. Or, uh, until it's under a broker. Until you got sponsored. Okay, because you can have an inactive license, but you can have your broker sponsored. Okay. Now the license application, you have to disclose. This is a must. You must disclose if you had any guilt or a no contest to a felony, or you were convicted of a felony. Okay, you have to, no way to say what's about it. And you must provide, these are requirements and they will ask you on the test, mailing address, telephone number, email if you have it which i highly recommend you put an email or you're going to be waiting in the mail for snail mail okay get your email because this is how they'll email you your license otherwise you got to wait and notice to track of any changes okay and that's only 10 days now mr eugene because you got a, a criminal history record okay 
We got to make sure that each applicant for license or renewal is to submit a complete set of fingerprints. And that's everybody. Okay, so that thank you and Travis Rob yesterday. Y'all got y'all got they're gonna find out about it. So. Are you gonna use Aiden's hand? Yeah, okay. If I can borrow half that million dollars. <laughs> but but yeah, so in that situation, each applicant for a license or a renewal, you gotta get your fingerprints checked. Okay. And it's not the old traditional way of putting it in black ink and then rolling your no, you don't do that no more. It is an electronic device that you just roll your fingers, okay? Trek shall con uh, conduct a criminal history check for using from the applicant or license holder. They will have DPS, FBI, and other criminal agencies that will review your background, and there will be a moral character determination that will be made based upon 1101.353 to determine if you are qualified. Now, I will tell you, for those of you that are taking this class, if you have a criminal background, it does not automatically mean you're going to be knocked out. Okay? I had a guy that was in jail for murder, served his time, got out, came to the school, took classes, and was put on a probationary license. Okay? But he's on probationary status for two years. If he does good, then they'll let him keep his license. But if he does anything just as bad as a traffic ticket, he can lose his license. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, what are the general eligibilities for requirements? At the time of application, you have to be, and Mr. Eugene, I'm not certain you're this first one here. You have to be 18. So you might you might be you might might, might want to hold out. So you have to be a U.S. citizen or a lawfully admitted alien. Oh, so, Mr. Mr. Eight, you're going to have to leave because you're from uh, from Mars, I believe. So you're going to have to leave, sir. Yeah. So you don't have to go back. And then women are from Venus. Women are from Venus. Uh oh, women are from Venus. So, so there you go. <laughs> So, so in those situations, you say we already got problems. Everybody got to go home. So we, we just call it a night. night. That, that's what you were right, Travis. Wasn't that what you were saying earlier? Just, <laughs> and you have to be a, which I believe this one actually just got removed in the last legislation. I don't think you have to be a Texas resident anymore. So that has been removed. Okay. So, Miss Eugene, you got two of them that, that you know, you just got to work on that. So. Now, Mr. Mr. Grossman here, this is the one who has some problems. He, he's got to show the second one, competency. I'm still wondering, have you met that qualification yet, Mr. Grossman, competence? Uh, I'm still waiting on the test results. Oh, you're still waiting on the call? Okay, <laughs> you are still waiting. So, <laughs> so you have to end up, to be eligible, you have to demonstrate honesty. So you got to be truthful, trustworthy, and integrity. Okay. And you have to demonstrate competency, and that's how they get you. How do they determine competency? It's by passing your exam. Okay? So just because you took these classes does not mean you're competent. The competency is the exam. Okay? Not administered by Justin. Okay, a lot of people tell you, you don't want me to administer the exam because of how hard my tests are. But, again, it's not uh, based upon competency. Okay, in regards to the test you take here, it's the one that you take for the licensing. Now, of course, you also have to complete your required courses of study. Uh, and these are going to, of course, include three classroom hours of housing discrimination and community reinvestment, or three hours of constitutional law. Everything, of course, is included in our courses. Business entities must designate a managing officer as the agent. So just like here at Nobles Realty, it is a business entity, but I am the managing officer, okay? And to be a man managing officer, I have to be the designated agent, must be a broker, which is myself, and you must be in good standing. Now, I also had to prove that I had proof of $1 million in e and insurance, okay? And be licensed as a broker if receiving compensation on behalf of the license holder. Okay. So I have to hold a very large policy for E&O insurance. 
okay, because the fact is you're dealing with multiple people. Now, these are the required courses that you must take, all right? You must take a total of 180 hours. Those of you that have been with me, y'all have completed every one. If you started with me on day one, you've completed every one except for the very first one. We're currently in that one as we speak, okay? But there's 60 classroom hours. That's why it's broken into two classes. The education, of course, is waived if the applicant has license as a broker or sales agent within the last two years of filing. Note that one semester hour, the so one semester hour equals a total of 15 classroom hours. So if you took your classes at Glenn or another college, every hour equaled 15 hours of classroom. So if you had three hours, how much does that come to? 45, okay? So in that situation is one semester hour gives you 15 hours of classroom. Now, what if you want to be a broker? Say that, Travis, you want to be a broker. Here we go. You ready? Yeah. you got to have 900 classroom hours or 60 semester hours. Okay. You have to have 18 semester hours in qualifying real estate with two hours in real estate brokerage. You have to have 42 qualifying or related hours, which basically is a bachelor's degree, okay? And in the past 60 months, you had to have been active four years, okay? And within that four-year period, you had to have met the 3,600-point rule, okay? And what that means is that you have to end up it's the basically 3,600 points is the equivalent of 12 houses over four years. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, so you have to sell within four years, you have to sell 12 houses, which is approximately three houses every year, which isn't that difficult if you really wanted to do it. Okay. The education experience can be waived if an applicant was a licensed broker or sales agent within two years of filing. Okay, uh, but again, it's very difficult to get through that last option, all right, the last resort. Now, the alternative broker experience, they must meet the same education requirements and must have four years of the previous 60 months of active broker in another state. So if Mr. Travis was licensed as a broker in Florida and he moved here, well, as long as he's been active for four years in the other state, he can come over here, meet the same requirements for education, and then get his license. Okay. Now, Shrek, of course, will issue the appropriate license, either the broker or sales agent, when licensing requirements are met. The sales agent license will be inactive until the sponsored by a licensed broker. So, Mr. Eight, your license would stay inactive so long as you're not sponsored. But the minute you're sponsored, you go active and you can start working. Okay? And you can go back and forth. So, you could be active and then go inactive and be active and go inactive and back and forth, back and forth. But as you do it, if you want to be a broker, every time you're inactive, those are subtracted from your active years. Makes sense. They can, Trek can deny your license. They can be like, Miss Linda, sorry, you did not meet our requirements, so we denied your license. Okay? You have a right, however, to have a hearing to, to ask why your license was denied. Okay? An inactive sales license, okay? When a broker sales agent relationship is terminated, so if, for example, that uh, Mr. Aiden, you come in and I'm just like, God, Aiden, you just drive me crazy, I'm terminating you. At that moment, when I terminate you with track, you are terminated. You are inactive at that moment. Can you negotiate contracts? No. Can you have listings? No. Can you do anything whatsoever? No. So what happens if you were representing Mr. Keith and you had a sign in his yard and your broker terminated you? I better go get the sign. 
sign it all needs to be pulled off because you cannot mark it. Okay. What if you're in the middle of a contract and your con and your broker terminates you? I guess. Where's it go to? Goes back to the broker. Okay. So if you're terminated, what ends up happening is once you're terminated, the broker shall immediately notify Trick, and your license becomes inactive in that moment. That's why I always tell people all the time is if you're going to leave the firm, in any firm, you should always just go to the other broker, get sponsored by that broker so there is no lapse in activity. You see what I'm saying? Because otherwise what happens is if you go inactive and you're negotiating, say you and Travis are doing a deal, well, hell, you get terminated, you're inactive, and you continue to make any phone calls, you are breaking the law. Okay? To be, re, or to be reactivated, you have to, of course, have a sponsoring broker, pay any fees that are required, and make certain that your continuing education is up to date. Okay? Your SAEs or your MCEs. I'll explain this. SAE is your first renewal. So your first renewal within your timeline, okay? So say, for example, that uh, Aiden, you end up, this is your first upcoming renewal, you have to do the SAE requirements. The SAE requirement is going to end up in this particular situation. They are going to go over and it's going to be 98 hours that you have to complete, which means you have to complete three 30 hour courses in legal update one and two. Okay. After you've done your first renewal, you get to do your MCEs and that's only 18 hours. Okay. And that's legal update one and two and another elective course. Make sense? Okay. Now examinations. Okay, by the way, any of y'all that are need to take your examination, Miss Linda said she'd be more than glad to take it for y'all. Uh, and she'll pass them for your first try. So and God hey. knows that this ceiling's gonna fall down fast. Well Miss Leela, didn't you say Miss Linda could take your test for you? No, Miss Leela, tell the truth. You know, I'm a little scared of Miss Linda. <laughs> so I'm going to tell the truth and say uh, we did not have those kind of discussions. <laughs> I'm saying work here. Get worse. <laughs> Mr. Garrett will take y'all's tests for you. Just y'all. Y'all don't worry. Mr. Garrett got y'all. So, and Mr. Keith. Mr. Garrett, Mr. Keith got y'all. They'll make A's for your first try. Somebody will take my test for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, in this situation, yes, in the exams, we have to, of course, they're prepared and contracted by TREC. Uh, the exams, of course, are going to be given throughout the entire state. Uh, the commission does provide a study outline, which if you continue with the program with us, at the end you'll do a prep course, and it's going to cover you everything you need to know for the exam. Uh, the exam has to be passed within 12 months. So if your license is filed, your application is filed today, you have 12 months from today to pass your exam. Okay. However, the key thing about this is you do not have an unlimited attempt. So if Ms. Linda, you file your application today and you fail it the first three tries, you have to take another 30 hours of this content and go back and retry. Okay, but you got to do all of that within the 12 month period. So you may end up, you may take it three times, fail three times, take the course again, do another three attempts, fail and do it again. But you have to do it within 12 months. So you have to pass both exams. Now, that means Miss Linda, if you pass the national on your first try, but keep failing the state and you don't pass it within 12 months, guess what happens? What happens, Travis? Oh, you got a DS on all over. Again. Start all over. Take them both all over again. Oh, no. Yep. I believe you only get three attempts as well. Yep. If you fail three attempts in a row, you have to start over again. Yep. Uh -uh. So, yes, you do get to have that kind of fun, Miss Linda. No. So, Miss Leela said you can take it for her, and Enrique said you can take his too, so you're good. If they want their license, I suggest they take them themselves. <laughs> 
I mean, the fun, the fun part is taking it over again doesn't mean you just take it over again. You need to take all the courses over again. Yep. You're going to be back in this room for another three months. Yep. You mean that is more torture? Oh, oh, oh absolutely. No. And I'll be teaching that. Hey, hey, oh, you'll have a great time, uh, Linda. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. So Trent does notify the examinee uh, that basically on the 14th day after their results of receiving the testing service, they'll finally tell you. In reality, Trent basically gives it to you right away. In reality, okay? If the exam is not passed, again, there's an analysis of the exam performance, so it actually breaks down where you're weak in and where you're strong in. And again, re-examination is possible on part failed, okay? Uh, again, like it shows up here, an applicant who fails the exam three consecutive times is required to show that the applicant has subsequently completed additional education before the applicant can take the examination again or reapply for a license. So failed of the national part means 30 hours of mandatory qualification of education. Failed of the state, 30 hours of the mandatory qualifying education. Failed both, you got to do 60 hours. Okay. And that basically comes back to taking these courses that you're taking. Okay. Now, the exam may be waived if you're a previous Texas broker. So the applicant was licensed as a broker within two years prior to the filing of the application. Uh, if they were a previous sales agent, then the applicant was licensed as a broker or sales agent within two years again, or any current out of state license holder. Okay. There is going to be a requirement that you must show a government issued photo ID. There has to be reasonable accommodations for verifiable disabilities. They may refuse admi uh, admittance to late arrivals or disruptive conduct. And I'm going to tell you, their, their center that they use is very strict on this late arrivals. Okay, so if Miss Linda, you go in and you're two minutes late and you walk in there, they can deny you because your test was two minutes ago. And I actually had been in one when I took my broker's exam. I was sitting in the room and a guy walked in. And he's like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm running late. You know, here's my deal. And a guy looked him up and says, you were at 12 and it is 12.02. I'm sorry, you need to leave. And he said, but, but I got to repay. And he said, you got to repay everything. Okay. They don't, they don't play with it. So you want to be there. I always tell my, my people 30 minutes before. And most of the time, if you get there 30 minutes before, if they're not busy, guess what they do? Go on in. Go on in and get started. Okay. Um, examination content, of course, is very confidential. Grounds for disapproval of a license application if you try to steal it. Okay. They're very strict. I'm going to tell you guys and gals, the exam centers do not play. They are very strict. They catch you cheating. They will log you out. They will log cheating. And they will report it to Trek, and Trek can disapprove your application. You are given a calculator, but you do not bring your own. They will give you a calculator. Uh, and you'll need it. I'm going to tell you, you will need it. There's a passing score that you must get on each section. You have to have a 70% pass as a sales agent and 75% to be a broker. Okay. So, the general steps for a real estate license application. You must meet the residency and the age requirements. You must meet educational requirements. And you'll have to follow the application for inactive sales agent license form, as well as your transcripts and your fees. Okay. You also will obtain a letter of eligibility from TREC. After they get that, they'll give you the eligibility to take the exam. You'll then apply with the testing service to take that exam and pay your fee. And you may file a sales agent sponsorship form before or after the exam. Most of the time, though, it's going to be after, not before. Of course, your renewal period will not exceed 24 months, meaning your license is only good for how often, Mr. Aiden? Two years. Two years. Okay. Trek rules do determine the expiration date, and these are usually the last day of the month, right? Mr. Groth, with a question, how many uh, slides are in this section? Uh, Total? In the 
So the number will be 134. So we are a little bit over tonight, yeah. more than halfway. Yeah, we you, you went through a lot more than I thought you were going to. Okay, so let me finish this one and then we'll we'll just yeah. keep we'll talk. He's going. Okay, right there a lot in the next one. I don't think the next one. Okay, okay. I thought one of them had a lot. Another one. Okay. So the license does expire six months or longer. Okay. They may not renew. So if your license, Mr. Aiden, say you don't renew your license. Well, if it's six months or longer, then you cannot renew. And you would have to meet the new education requirements. You must retest. However, under TREC rules 535 56 and 535 57 permit that you can have a waiver of exam up to two years and waiver of education experience up to four years. Okay, but it's always best, I always tell people this all the time if you're not going to practice, go inactive and just keep your license inactive. Just pay your fee, it's very little, and just reactivate it whenever you're ready. You may not use it for five or ten years, that's fine, but don't let it go away. I can't tell you how many students I've had in my classes that they were real estate agents 10 years ago and they had to start all over from scratch because of the fact of the matter is, is that they just let their license lapse. Okay? You don't want to get into that. Information that's required for renewal. Proof of required continuing education. Disclosure of any felony conviction or plea of guilty or nolo contero. Uh, and then also you have a set, a complete set of your fingerprints to track for a criminal history check, and it may renew if at least one set of fingerprints are on file. Again, we talked about this, the first renewal, the SAEs for the most new sales agents is at 90 additional classroom hours. And understand that Trek always does everything in 30s, okay? So what happens is, is that means how many classes? 90 it's three glasses okay uh, and you have to have evidence of completion of 18 semester hours which is 270 classroom hours for any qualifying courses okay every renewal after the SAE is your mandatory continuing education again this is 18 classroom hours every two years Mandatory continuing education is for all sales agents. It's also going to be for all brokers unless they're exempt from the MCEs. And it's 18 classroom hours every two years. The MCEs, of course, are going to be 18 hours that must be completed during the two year period. At least eight hours must be in legal one and legal two. For sponsoring brokers or designated brokers or supervisors, they must also take an additional six broker responsibility course hours. Okay. Of course, in regards to the remaining hour, hours that are there, y'all can take whatever you want. Okay, you can take whatever you want. So they need to be though relevant issues such as impacting the practice of real estate or increasing the competency of a license holder, the qualifying real estate courses, the real estate related courses that are approved by the state bar for CLE, or some professional designation courses such as the GRI can be utilized. There can be an extension for the MCE completion up to 60 days. You'll have to pay a payment of an additional $200 with the late fee as well. If they're not completed within 60 days, then you'll have to pay a $250 late reporting fee, a $200 referral fee, and a $20 reactivation fee. Because Mr. Eugene likes a bunch of fees, so we like to, we like to put a bunch on there for you. Mr. Uh, Travis, do you think we should add some more fees for Mr. Eugene? Yeah, just for Okay, just for him. Keep on going. Now, in regards to the broker responsibility education course, it is going to be required of the broker who sponsors a sales agent. It's the designated broker of a business entity that sponsors agents as well, or for the license holders who supervises another license. Again, there are six hours every two years that are created by TREC 
and these do count towards your MCEs. Now, if you are a certificate holder, this would be an individual that has a right-of-way agent. This person who sells, buys, leases, or transfers an easement or right-of-way for another for compensation, such as a utility, railroad, or pipeline, uh, pipeline, they must register with TREC unless the person is a licensed broker or real estate agent. Fixed offices. If they are the broker shall maintain a fixed office. So it means if you're a broker, you have to have a local office that you can be, that you have to have an address. So you have to have an address on file. If there is any change of address, it has to happen within 10 days of relocating. If there's going to be branch offices, each branch office must have a license that is required if the broker has more than one office location. The residential, if this is going to be a residential rental locator, they have to promptly display the locator's license and the consumer information form. The license display not required though for other license holders. TREC does deliver a copy of each sales agent's license to the sponsoring broker. The title notice to buyer is that when we offer to the purchase a real estate is signed, the license holder must advise the buyer in writing to have the abstract examined by an attorney or to obtain title insurance. And we've talked about that before. There are certain disclosures of certain information relating to occupants. The license holder is not required to acquire, disclose, or release information that deals with AIDS or HIV, death by natural causes, suicide, or accident related to the property condition. Yes, that means that if there was a defect on the property and the person died on the property, you can't tell them. Ain't that nice? All right, I am gonna stop here, okay? Mr. Uh, Grossman, go ahead and stop recording.